All right, so this is the first piece of the final exam review packet. Uh, what I've done is I've gone in and pulled out the constructed and extended response questions from the uh, part one review packet, so the first review packet. Uh, specifically, the first three problems here are an excellent, excellent representation of part one of your final exam, which is constructed and extended response. So you need to be prepared to see questions like these first three. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through these first three. I'm going to do my best to explain them as clearly as I can and write you through the process of exactly what you need to do to earn full credit on this type of problem. So here we have a two-part open-ended question. Uh, this is a system of equations problem. And I will try to explain how I know that here after I read the problem. Jose and his friends buy snacks each week for their Christmas steady, chemistry study group. Last week, they bought 12 bags of chips and 9 Powerades, and they spent $54. This week, they bought 4 bags of chips and 8 Powerades and spent $28. Part A, write a system of equations to represent this problem. Be sure to define your variables. So we will start by defining our variables, and hopefully that will help show why this is a system of equations word problem. Uh, if we look, we have two equations, one for last week, so that's going to be our first equation. And we have one for this week, that will be our second equation. And if we look, there are two items being bought each week. We have bags of chips, so we'll highlight that here. That's the first item they're purchasing is a bag of chips. And we have Powerades, which is a type of drink. So that you notice I bought those same two items both, day, both times. The second week they also bought bags of chips and Powerades. So those are what we're going to represent with our variables. So we write out, let x represent. Now, it could be the number or the cost, but it really depends on what you're told. If you look here, we are actually told how many of both items are purchased each week, which means we are not looking for the number of items purchased. We are looking for the price of one item. So we would say let X represent the price of a bag of chips. So that will be our X. And let Y represent... the price or cost, it doesn't matter which one you say, of a power aid. Okay? So, then we're going to write one equation for each of our two weeks. So last week, they purchased 12 bags of chips, so 12x, and, that's a plus sign, nine power aids for fifty four dollars so our equation for last week our first equation would be 12x plus 9y equals 54 then we have another equation for this week so that's our second equation this week they bought four bags of chips and eight power aids for twenty eight dollars there's our system of equations each equation is written in standard form. That takes care of part A. Part B says solve your system. Uh, we are trying to find the cost of a bag of chips and the cost of a Powerade. So I guess in theory I probably should have written cost for both of these, but it really doesn't matter. Cost, price, it's the same thing. So anyway, solve your system to find the cost of a bag of chips. So if I'm looking at this system of equations, and I'm trying to decide how to proceed. This is not a problem that is set up to use the substitution method. This is definitely set up for elimination. So if we look at this, we need to make a decision. It doesn't matter which variable we eliminate. I look at this and I think 12 won't be that bad. All I need to do to, to get rid of the 12 is I need to multiply the second equation by negative 3. This will change positive 4 into negative 12 and allow me to cancel x. 
Now, I can't just multiply negative or positive 4 by negative 3. I have to multiply both sides of the equation, which means all three of these terms by negative 3. So when I do that, my first equation will be unchanged, 12x plus 9y equals 54. And my second equation, when I multiply everything by negative 3, will become negative 12x minus 24y equals, uh, what's that, 84? Yeah, negative 84. Again, that's this equation times negative 3. So 4 times negative 3 is negative 12. 8 times negative 3 is negative 24. 28 times negative 3 is negative 84. I'm also a little bit worried that people are going to see this y and get confused. So I'd like to clean that up real quick before we continue. So again, we've got 24y down here. And we have 9y up here. There we go. Much better. So we're going to then add those equations together to carry out elimination. And when we add those equations together, the x term will drop out. That will leave us with negative 15y equals negative 30. So to solve that, we need to divide each side by negative 15. And that gives us that y equals 2. So then we have to think to ourselves, okay, y is 2. Well, what is y? y is the cost of a Powerade. So a Powerade costs $2. Now, we still need to figure out the cost of a bag of chips. Well, now that we know what y is, we can simply plug that into one of these two equations to find x. So let's say we plugged into, it doesn't matter, the bottom equation. That would give us 4x plus 8 times 2 equals 28. You could just as easily put that 2 in here for this y. You should get the same answer either way. So we do 8 times 2, which would be 16. And then that's a two-step equation. So we would subtract 16 from each side, giving us that 4x equals 12. And then we would divide by 4, giving us that x equals 3. Now again, I think ourselves x. Well, what is x? x is the cost of a bag of chips. So a bag of chips is $3. This is a little all over the place. Now, if this were an actual standardized test, such as the I-STEP, you would not show anywhere near this much work in the computer. Okay, on part A, you'd have to pretty much show everything that you showed, except for this red part here. That would be done on your scratch paper, as would pretty much all of this work um, as you went through. So anyway, that would be a perfect four-point answer on that four-point question. Let's try the next one. So this problem, this is a projectile motion word problem, which is where we solve a quadratic equation. Now, this is what we did most recently in class, so I hope it's relatively fresh in our minds. A toy rocket is launched from the top of a hill. The height of the rocket is modeled by the function f of x equals negative 16x squared plus 32x plus 48, where x is the time in seconds and f of x is the height of the rocket in feet. Part A, what is the maximum height of the rocket? Now that's a word that we should recognize as maximum. Right away, as soon as we see maximum, we should know that because this is a parabola, if we're looking for the maximum, what that's really telling us to do is find the vertex. So we need to be finding the vertex on part A. That is what we're looking for. Now the second question says, how long did it take to reach this height? How long would be an x value? That's actually the axis of symmetry. So what we do first is we find the axis of symmetry. Remember that that is given by x equals negative b over 2a. Now what are b and a? Well, if we go back and look at the equation, a is the lead coefficient. It's negative 16. b is the second number in the equation, which is 32. And c, which is the one we don't even need right now, is 48. So a, b, and c are given in the equation. Negative b over 2a would be negative 32 over 2 times negative 16. 
Well, that's negative 32 divided by negative 32, which would be 1. Okay, so we have x equals 1. That's part of our answer. We're going to need to write it out in words, obviously, but there's our first part of our answer. x equals 1 is the x-coordinate of the vertex. So then we have to find the y-coordinate. Well, the y-coordinate, that's where we do f of 1. We plug that value into the function for x. So that would be negative 16 times 1 squared plus 32 times 1 plus 48, which would be negative 16 plus 32 plus 48, or 64. Okay, so now we're ready to answer the question. We just have to think to ourselves, which number answers which question? Well, the maximum height of the rocket, height, is given by f of x, which is y. How long? That's a time. So that's going to be our x. So we are going to say the maximum height of the rocket is 64 feet. This happens one second after launch. And again, that's because the vertex is occurring at 164, where 1 is the time in seconds and 64 is the height in feet. Okay, part B says, how long did it take for the rocket to hit the ground? Now, we were told in the problem that the height of the rocket is f of x. So the ground would be when f of x is equal to 0. So what this problem is telling you to do is set f of x equal to 0 and solve to find the root solution zeros or x-intercepts, depending on what word you'd like to use. So it's saying 0 equals negative 16 x squared, shouldn't be a t, x squared, waiting on the computer, come on computer, all right, negative 16x squared plus 32x plus 48. Now that is already equal to 0, so that step is done for us. Now we just need to solve. Now I look at this problem and I go, it's probably factorable as is. I could use the quadratic formula as is, but neither one of those would be nearly as fast as solving it by factoring. So the first thing I do anytime I factor anything in any way is look for a greatest common factor. All of these terms are divisible by 16. Now more than that, I want my a value when I factor to be positive 1 if I can. So instead of dividing by 16, I'm going to divide everything by negative 16. Now while this does technically change the equation and the graph, it does not affect where that graph crosses the x-axis. It does not affect the roots, zeros, or solutions. So, we can change that into 0 equals x squared minus 2x minus 3, which means we are looking for two numbers that multiply to negative 3 and add to negative 2. Well, there's only two pairs of numbers that even multiply to negative 3, negative 1 and positive 3, and positive 1 and negative 3. And if we add those up, it is pretty obvious which one we're supposed to use because we're supposed to use the one that adds up to negative 2, which would be 1 and negative 3. Now this is simple trinomial factoring, which means all we have to do is go straight to the factored form, which would be x plus 1 and x minus 3 because our numbers were positive 1 and negative 3. Okay, now, from there, we're going to apply the zero factor theorem, which says that one of my two factors, either x plus 1 or x minus 3, has to equal zero. That means I have two one-step equations to solve, and the roots of this equation, the algebraic answers, would be negative 1 and positive 3. 
Now this is where the context of the situation comes in again because it says right here, explain why you chose the answer you did. So which answer is the correct answer? Well, in the context of the problem, the correct answer is positive 3 because time cannot be negative. Okay, in the situation, we're only talking about the flight of the rocket after it is launched, and it's launched at time zero, so it can't have a negative x value. Even though the graph of this, the graph of the equation that models this system has a root at negative one, this situation does not allow that root to be part of the problem. It's not part of the context of the problem. So our answer is three. How long did it take for the rocket to hit the ground? The rocket hit the ground after three seconds. That is a perfect answer to the second four-point problem. Now notice that the explain why you chose the answer you did, that's this part right here. You cannot leave that out. You do have to state time cannot be negative. You have to state that. Okay, so that's two down, one to go of the ones that perfectly model the final. So here's the third one. This is the long problem. It's the three-parter. So Mr. Rich recently planted a crop of money trees in his garden. He then compared the growth of three different trees, tree A, tree B, and tree C, over a period of months. Now, if you look at the graphic, you'll notice that the three trees are each represented in a different way. Tree A is represented with words. Tree B is represented with a table. And tree C is represented with a graph. Now, if you went on to read the rest of this problem, you would realize that you're supposed to be comparing the rate of change, or slope, and the initial height, or y-intercept, of each of these equations. They're all linear equations. So what we need to do is we need to put all three of those into the same form, which is what it asks you to do in part A. It says for each tree, write an equation in slope-intercept form to represent this situation. So we are going to write three equations in part A, and we're going to show all of our work up above. Okay? So tree A is the easy one. Okay, and again, we want to put these all into the same format, so we're going to write them all in slope-intercept form, y equals mx plus b, where m is the rate of change, or the growth rate of the tree, and b is the initial height. So if we look at the description in part a, it says the first tree was 5 inches tall when planted. That tells us that our b value is 5, and it has grown 4 inches every month. That tells us that m equals 4. So for tree A, our equation would be 4x plus 5. That's the easy one. On tree B, it says measurements were taken of the second tree and given below. Again, you'll notice that it has the time and the height, so that'd be your x and your y. We need to figure out a slope and an intercept. Now remember that the y-intercept is when x equals 0. So right there, this 3 is your b value because that is the intercept of that table, the y-intercept. Now slope's a little bit trickier. We need to choose two of these points and it does not matter at all which two because it is linear. And we need to find the change in x, which would be plus 1, and the change in y, which would be plus 4.5. Remember that one way to write slope is the change in y over the change in x. So that would be 4.5 divided by 1, or 4.5. So for tree b, y equals the slope, 4.5x, plus the intercept of 3. That just leaves the graph. Now there are some numbers written on this graph that are not particularly easy to read. I am 100% sure that this point right here is the point 631. So I will use that point and the y-intercept, which is 0, 10, to figure out the slope. Now notice that we know the b value is 10 right there. Okay. So on a graph, when we find the slope, what we do is we do rise over run. So what we do is we make a right triangle out of these two points. 
and we ask ourselves to get from one of these points to the other point, what do we have to do? Well, we're going up 21 inches and we're going right six months. So our slope which would be rise over run. Or notice I'm spelling rise with a Y, so remember to put the Y on top. Would be up 21 and right 6. That would be 21 over 6, which reduces to 7 halves. Now, be, because we had a 4.5 slope here, I'm going to change this into a decimal and write 3.5 for my slope. So for tree C... y equals 3.5x plus 10. Now we're going to need all three of those equations to answer the next two parts. Notice it doesn't tell us anywhere in part A that we have to explain where that came from. All of this work would be done off the screen if you were doing this on a computer problem. You do not need to show any work if it does not tell you to show your work. So all that work would be done on scratch paper. Part B says, which tree was tallest when it was initially planted? So what we're going to do here is I'm going to grab a picture of those equations so that we have them on this screen. So give me just one second to grab that. Here's our equations. Okay, and we're going to place that here where we can see it. You shouldn't need to do that because you've got your paper in front of you and you can still see Part A. So Part B says, which tree was the tallest when it was initially planted. So it's saying, which tree has the greatest y-intercept? And then the second question says, which tree is growing the most in inches per month? So then the second part of the question says, which tree has the greatest slope? So we're going to answer those two questions. The first question is, which tree was the tallest? We look at our y-intercepts of 5, 3, and 10. Of those three, which one is the biggest? That's right, 10. So we would say tree C was the tallest when planted. And we're supposed to justify. That's simple. We just say 10 is bigger than 5 is bigger than 3. That solves that problem. That tells the grader that you know which numbers you're looking at, the y-intercepts, and that you're aware that 10 is bigger than 5 and 3. Now for the second question, which one has the greatest slope, we look at 4, 4.5, and 3.5, and we do the same thing. Which one is growing the fastest? Tree B. So we say tree B is growing the fastest. And again, it is very simple to explain our reasoning here. We simply say 4.5 is greater than 4 is greater than 3.5. We list them in order from biggest to smallest. That justifies our reasoning. Part C, which tree is the tallest after six months? Use words, numbers, and or symbols to justify your answer. Six months is an x value. That's telling us we need to let x equal 6. And we need to evaluate all three trees. So we would say tree A, y would equal 4 times 6 plus 5. That would be 24 plus 5, or 29, and I believe this is in inches. Is it feet? I guess I should look. Come on, computer. There we go. Inches. Inches. Just looking for the unit there. 29 inches. We do the same thing for tree B. Plug in 6 for the Y. So 4.5 times 6 plus 3. That would be 27 plus 3 or 30 inches, so tree B is taller than tree A. 
And finally for tree C, same thing, y equals 3.5 times 6 plus 10. That would be 21 plus 10 or 31 inches. So the answer would be tree C is the tallest after six months. And we don't need to provide any additional justification because we've shown our work. All right. So those three questions, excuse me, those three questions are the best approximation for what your final exam, first section of your final exam is going to look like. But there are a couple more on the packet that are of decent value in terms of preparing for the final. So I'm going to add those to this video as well. All right, so the next one occurs a couple pages in. Uh, you may want to pause the video after I turn the page here and find this problem. The Red Bus Company charges $150 plus $72 per hour to run a bus. The Blue Bus Company charges $240 plus $54 per hour. Part A, write two equations, one for each bus company, that represent the total cost of running a bus for X hours. Then use your equations to determine the number of hours that the cost of both bus companies is the same. So we've got these two bus companies, and in both cases they give us a slope and an intercept. So what we need to do is we need to write two equations, one for the red bus company and one for the blue bus company. And in both cases we're going to use y equals mx plus b again. So for the red bus company, the total cost y is equal to $72 per hour which would be 72x, again that per tells us that that's a slope, plus a $150 charge. Same idea for the blue bus company, the total cost is set $240 plus $54 per hour, so that's 54x plus 240. There's our equations, that's the first part of the answer. It says then use your equations to determine the number of hours that the cost is the same. So the y's would be the same, which means what we're supposed to do is set the right sides of those equations equal to each other and solve for x. So to solve for x, we have an x on each side. We will subtract 54x from each side and subtract 150 from each side. That will get the x alone on one side and the number alone on the other. 72 minus 54 is 18x, and 240 minus 150 is 90. Then we would divide by 18, and that would give us that x equals 5. So we would say the cost is the same at 5, and I believe this is hours. Yes, hours. Part B says, Mr. Zartman, oh look at that, our principles in the word problem, wants to rent a bus for eight hours, which company should he choose? So real simply, we're going to take this eight and we're going to plug that in for x. We're going to say x equals eight. And we're going to figure out which company is cheaper because he should choose the cheaper company. So for the red bus line or bus company, y would equal 72 times eight plus 150 and for the blue bus company y would equal 54 times 8 plus 240 so we go to our calculator and we do that 72 times 8 plus 150 is 726 dollars 54 times 8 plus 240 is $672. Okay, so which bus company should he choose? We would say Mr. Zartman should choose the blue bus company. Why? Because they are cheaper. 
And again, if we've shown our work, that's all the justification that we need to give. All right. Here is the next problem. This one's again further into the po into the uh, packet. This is very similar to the three-part question we did a minute ago. Uh, Mary is comparing different options for shipping Christmas presents from the North Pole. We have here two different companies, Elves Express and Santa Stuff. You'll notice that both of these are showing a linear equation. One is showing a graph and one is showing a table. So part A is just like part A from the other question. Write an equation to model the, each shipping company. Describe what the rate of change in y-intercept mean in the context of the problem. So we need to develop a y equals mx plus b equation for each one of these things. So we start with the graph, Elves Express. We have a y-intercept of 6. Now you'll notice other points are marked here. We just need to figure out the rise and the run between any two of those points. So let's say we use these two because they're the ones that were marked on the graph. To get the slope, we need to go up to and right to. So our slope, which is rise over run, is going to be up to and right to. That is 2 over 2, or 1. So for Elves Express, it would help if I could spell, our equation would be y equals 1x plus 6. For Santa's stuff, you'll notice we have a little bit worse of a situation because we're not given the intercept. So what we have to do instead is we have to come up with a point slope version of the equation and then solve for y to put it into slope intercept. So we still need to start with the slope. So again, we have weight, which is our x, and shipping cost, which is y. So we need to figure out the change in x. This is going up by 4. And the change in y. It's going up by 6. And that tells us our slope. Our slope would be our change in y over our change in x, which would be 6 over 4, or 1.5, 3 halves. So then we take one of these points, let's say the first one, and we call it x1 and y1. And we say y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. We put it into point slope form. So that would be y minus 11 equals 1.5 times x minus 4. And we proceed to solve for y. So to solve for y, we would start by distributing 1.5. That would give us y minus 11 equals 1.5x minus 6. And then to get x by or to get y by itself, all we have to do is add 11 to each side. So that would give us the equation y equals 1.5x plus 5. So for Santa's stuff, y would equal 1.5x plus 5. Now the other part of this question is not worded very well. Describe what the rate of change in the y-intercept mean in the context of the problem. So uh, the best thing I can do here is answer it the way it's written. Um, the one on your final is worded much better than that. But let's start with the y-intercept. The y-intercept in the context of the problem, the y-intercept is the initial cost for shipping anything. And then the amount that you pay is based on the rate of change. The rate of change in this case is the cost of shipping per pound. So the cost that you pay depends on how heavy the package is, which is pretty standard. All right, so we're going to go to part B. I'm fairly certain that we're going to need these equations, so I'm going to go ahead and grab them now. Make sure I've got them. 
more than I need. There we go. Okay, so part B for this problem, whenever the computer decides to change a the page, there it goes, says what is a reasonable domain of the functions? So let's go back to the, graphs real, the graph real quick. We are not, I mean, think about the situation here. We are shipping a package, and it is not possible for that package to not have weight. I mean, I guess if you wanted to ship something that weighed nothing, they would be more than happy to charge you these $6 and let you send the empty box. But that's not reasonable. Okay, You don't ship things that don't have weight. So a reasonable domain, remember what domain means. Domain is your input, your x values, the numbers that you're putting into your function. So in this case, a reasonable domain would be all positive real numbers. Because the weight needs to be a positive number. It can't be negative. It can't be zero. That wouldn't make sense. Okay, so then part C is the challenging part. And I'm going to stick our equations in here so that we can talk about this. Okay, and I'm going to bring them down here. Um, describe when you should choose each shipping company. Justify your answer using words, numbers, and or symbols. Now, initially, it will definitely be cheaper at the beginning to use Santa's stuff. Now, how do we know that? We know that because the initial cost is lower. But there is going to be a point where these two companies are the same cost. And we need to know that to answer the question. So just like we did earlier, what we need to do is we need to set these two things equal to each other. So we need to do 1x plus 6 equals 1.5x plus 5, and we need to solve for x. So we're going to move the x's to one side by subtracting 1x from each side, and the numbers from the other side by subtracting 5 from each side. That gives us 1 equals 0.5x. Then to get x by itself, we're going to divide by 0.5. We're going to divide by 0.5. 1 divided by 0.5 is 2. So these companies will cost the same amount when x equals 2. Which means that one of the companies will be cheaper from 0 to 2, and the other company will be cheaper from 2 on, from 2 until whenever, whatever the heaviest package you can think of would be. And again, it's real simple. If Santa's stuff is cheaper initially, we would say, we should choose Santa's stuff. on the interval 0 to 2 pounds. I think it's in pounds. Whatever the units are on the weight. I'm pretty sure it's in pounds. I guess I should look. Yep, pounds. And from that point forward for all packages that weigh more than 2, And again, that all comes back to we know that the y-intercept for Santa's stuff is lower, which means initially Santa's stuff will be cheaper. You probably would need to explain more of this, but I'm my hand hurts. I've written a lot this week, so I am not going to write all this out. Okay. Again, we would say this is when, and then the justification would be, well, Santa's stuff has the lower initial cost. Give 
me writing it out. But after the weight of two pounds, Elves Express would be cheaper. There we go. I said I wouldn't write it out, but I did anyway. All right. So that should take care of that problem. I'm looking to see if there's another one. I'm not sure if there is. There is not. That is it for that piece. Again, the first part of your final will be three open-ended questions, exactly like the first three that were presented in this video. There will be a two-part systems of equations word problem exactly like the first problem in this video. There will be a projectile motion word problem, a, a quadratic word problem just like number two, same number of parts, similar questions, same number two that was in this video. There will be a three-part comparing linear equations word problem just like number three in this video. So you need to prepare yourself. You need to understand this. Look for later videos on the additional information you need to know for your final.